Join me, Harriet Gould, for the Lab Matters podcast to hear fascinating stories every week from the inspiring people behind the science. In this episode, I'm talking to Dr. Asa Asadolabek about how her career has evolved from children's books in Iran to entrepreneurship in Berlin. Join us to find out what makes this scientist tick. Okay, so Asa, welcome. It's very nice to have you here. Um, thank you for coming. Um, so now you were a um, scientist and you are a scientist and entrepreneur and uh, you um, consider yourself, you're focused now, your work is focused on um, optics and photonics. Um, but it didn't really start there. You were you were born in Iran and you spent your formative years there. Um, so tell me a little bit about that. Hi, Harriet. Thank you very much. And thanks for having me. Um, yes, I, I was born in Iran. Um, I'm, of course, I'm one of those who was born after the revolution, which means uh, we, we, we had schools, girls and boys separate. And uh, I mean, it was fun, I guess I would say, because um crazy times uh and uh, my brothers were going to another school I was going to another school and then we were all coming home and then working through our homeworks together and uh, um one thing in our family was that at least between me and my older brother we were both very much crazy about mathematics and physics I guess and we had this wow. competition but he was smarter than me I think he was smarter than me <laughs> and my mom was always like listen to your brother or whatever <laughs> um but uh yeah it was it was a uh, good times um yeah did, did you have a, that rivalry between you and your brother um with that with the physics aspect is that is that was that the hook that got you in, interested in science um it's a very good question I, I I don't know no for me I think it was mostly mostly learning new things right I mean that that rivalry was always there and uh, I think you you always have that with your older sibling and with your young I mean, at least with your younger you're more friends with your older one you're always in competition that was also what happened with us but for me the interest in science was all about learning new things I I was just hungry for learning new things. If, if a class was being repetitive, I was also bored. But also, to be honest, good teachers. I mean, when you love your teacher, you also love the lesson as well, right? So maybe I was lucky that I got a lot of teachers that did were good. The, the math and physics teachers were always good. But but it's definitely the hunger for learning new things that got me got me very much interested into science. And was it your teachers? Did they inspire you to look beyond Iran for your for your next bit of education? I would say a few did, a few did, and also you will be surprised. We had a we had a teacher in history. I loved her. She was very. I mean, even though I'm talking about history, right? It's not necessarily science, but she was very. She was always like, um, study more, study further, learn, read further than what you're doing. And uh, another thing that I guess helped as well, I loved, I liked learning even before school. I mean, before getting to that teacher, I mean. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, my mom, she registered me to some book reading club. I didn't know I was eight or something. And that, mean, that means I had five books per week, five children book per week to read. Five. And um, uh, yeah, five per week. I mean, these are tiny, like 10 pages and each okay. page has two <laughs> lines or something. But I think that was that was the first sort of um, interaction I had with reading and learning outside the school. And that's why I think it kind of uh, developed this sort of a hunger for learning and reading different things and new things. Mm -hmm. um, that really helped, I would say. Did you have a favorite of these 10 page books? Oh, I did. I had one. I had one, which is not a science space, but it was me. My um, it was written by a by also a a child in a story. I don't know writing stories class mm -hmm. or a workshop. Me, my um, my I forgot the name of this animal in English. What is it that has these spiky things on it? Um, oh, like a rhino or a hedgehog. <laughs> Hitchhike, hitchhike, me, my hitchhike and my doll. And oh my it was a, it was a very sad story that she was born in a very poor family and she was this delusional, schizophrenic 
girl, eight-year-old girl, maybe something. And she was taking her hitchhike and her doll to the school all the time. And it was a very sad story, to be honest. But that was my favorite book during that time, indeed. So you support the underdog, maybe? I, I would say, to, uh, yeah, I do. I do. I mean, it was a very, it was very well written. I was still amazed that this child, which is probably my age, can write so nicely. Wow, that, that is quite inspiring, I think, when you're when you're that young and you find something that you connect with so well. Indeed, indeed, definitely. So it wasn't it wasn't um, long then before you moved to the UK? Um, I would maybe yes, because I moved to UK when I was 23. So I did my undergraduates in Iran, which was my I did electronic engineering. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I finished my, my degree, I was kind of torn between, OK, find a job or at that time, the hype of doing an MBA was also quite high in Iran. So I was like, OK, do an MBA or find a job. Um, I started looking for jobs. But I mean, we're talking about Iran, electronic engineer for a woman. There's not that much to do, right? But there wasn't much to do in there wasn't much in, um... to do. I went to a couple of job applications and I realized I also don't like it. I mean, this is where you come out of the university, you think you're supposed to do something, but you're actually being interviewed for something else. And then I was like, okay, let's let's start preparing for this MBA exam. And I went to the I started preparing for that and I was reading these management books and I was like, oh my God, this is just playing with words. I mean, it these are all like everybody knows this is how you manage time you manage your project and everything and then I, I went back into okay what did I like I was like okay I did like the engineering side I did like everything I learned at university let's mm -hmm. go back to that maybe I should do a master's and um, then I also the idea of leaving Iran and going to England came to my mind because I always loved to go to England and I was like okay let's go to England but what to do there I went, you can't believe that. I went back to my high school books and I opened the books and I was like, if I want to choose a degree, what do I want to do? And I was going through the pages of my physics book. Mm -hmm. And then I'm, suddenly I saw one part that was, uh, was it was it was a sort of a free study. So it never came to any exam either, but I loved it. And it was telling us about, it was a, it was a section in the study of light and it was telling us how fiber optics work. And I thought to myself, I remember this. I know this very well. And I loved it. I remember I loved this part of light. So you know what? I'm going to look for a course which is on light and optoelectronic and all of that. And with that, I started looking for the university and found the University of Southampton is big in optoelectronics. And then I, I, I chose, the, chose the master course, which was Master of Nanoelectronics, because up to electronics school in Southampton University doesn't have a master degree, but the electronics school has a master degree and they're connected to each other. So if you do master degree here, you might be able to do your PhD in up to electronics center. And that's how I chose the university and then moved to UK. I see. I see. And what were your teachers like there? Were your lecturers? Your, who did you have? I mean, I'm amazing people. We, I had, uh, I had this uh, tutor. Um, from, I mean, of course now, Professor Darren Bacnell. Um, and he were, he was such a nice guy, such a nice guy. Mm -hmm. Also, I, one thing I did was that from the first day, I went into his room as mm -hmm. my, as my personal tutor because they allocated personal tutors to each master's student, especially to international ones. My first sentence to him was that I want to do a PhD. How can I get a scholarship? And I think he just remembered me and uh, he was a great help. He was actually the one that I managed to get my scholarship for my PhD as well. Wow. One was him, very helpful, young, very smart. And then we had another lecturer because, as I said, because I was doing a nanoelectronic course, none of the courses were on optoelectronics. Um, but because I said I want to do a PhD in optics and photonics, they said, OK, do this other course which was a study on optoelectronics and it was being taught by this professor peter smith mm -hmm. professor peter smith super english for me he was this super english person with this Great. sort of a cambridge accent i remember i first to his class i also you learn english but then you you move to the country ever like it's a completely different language right i went to his class and i couldn't understand him so he was the first lecture i actually had a recorder there to to understand so you, what you he said un, you literally couldn't understand what he was saying and no I couldn't no. I couldn't but then 
some one of my sort of uh, um, friends told me, how about you tell him? So at the end of the next next class, I went to him and I said, I'm really sorry, but I cannot understand your English. And he was like, oh, it's OK. Next next time he came back, he just I think he just changed the grammar. OK, there weren't so many like um, small sentences after each other. anymore. And wow, I could understand him very well. Very nice guy again as well. I learned a lot from his his course to I mean, very, very, very small example is that maybe people can relate to. I, I was good at math, math at school and at university. So we learned about Fourier transform. I learned that I could do that. This is a huge thing with a lot of like um, many lines of math that you have to do, but I never knew where to use it for. And uh, Peter Smith gave us one work, uh, sort of a coursework on how do you do this image processing um, and uh, you had to do this conversion of the optical fiber modes. And I had no idea. I, I literally was like, I don't know how to do this. So I went to him and I was like, I don't know how to do this. Mm -hmm. And he, he's, I remember he was like, do you remember Fourier transform where you learned it at, at undergraduate? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I remember that. And he was like, this is exactly that. And you have to use this and then uh, play with it. And then this is the mode, blah, blah. I was just like, I was blown away. I was like, wow, this is where you use those math and apply it to physics. I finally learned the thing. That was, that was a, I love him. He was a great lecturer, definitely. He just made those connections for you. That really, yeah, guides you in the right direction. Definitely. definitely. How, I mean, that must have impacted future work as well, because it must have made so much make sense. Yeah, exactly. I think that's it. I just needed someone to tell me. I mean, maybe also, I, I don't know, but someone to tell me this is how you connect the things together. It's the same way that you've used, I don't know, division and multiplication in physics. It's exactly the same thing. It's just in a different level. Mm -hmm. And uh, indeed, indeed, it, it helped a lot to be able to, of course, um, I mean, in simple words, do my coursework myself. But of course, later to use that all in research as well and come up with different ways of um, I mean I don't know do your calculations or even innovative ways of how to do especially because I'm more of an experimentalist so mm -hmm. how to use different methods um, uh, for for different applications indeed and mm -hmm. um, so then you, you graduated from Southampton what yeah I mean I did my master's and then I did my PhD so you and and then you moved back to Germany uh, no, no, I was, I was in, I was in England. I did my PhD and then I worked for two years as a postdoc there as well. Wow. So it was eight years of lifetime. In where did you, um, where did you work? To, as it was also Southampton University. University. Yeah. Yeah. In the same group, Darren Bagnell again. He was, I mean, he even said, I remember when I got my PhD, he was like, PhD scholarship, he was like, I saved you. He was my savior indeed. So um, he helped to get to find a PhD scholarship. He was also my um, second supervisor at the end, towards the end of my PhD. And then um, he also had a postdoc position that I could apply. And I was also the right candidate for that as well. So I worked in his group for, for two years um, mm -hmm. as a postdoc as well. It, it, was, it was a shame that um, the last year he moved to Australia and I was left on my own in, in Southampton. <laughs> But yeah, that's where I did my my next postdoc there, and uh, I, I worked on a different project than my my postdoc. But what I what I actually established and I really liked as well was I established the science communication sector of of the university at that time, where we took the lab, what we do we we do in the lab in nano electronics and nanotechnology lab to the science festivals and schools wow. and told children and public about. This is what we do in a clean room lab. Clean room lab. This is how we make the your your mobile phone chips, or this is how big Nano is, for example. And that that was uh, that was a great experience. So you probably inspired a whole cohort of um, people in Southampton to look into your area of expertise. I I I hope I have done that. That was the whole aim, to be honest. Um, one thing. It, I mean, I think that I think that's the time I, I, I found my passion. And to be honest, it's still now in Germany. I'm just waiting for my German to get better. And I'll definitely implement that here as well. The day um, I was I was telling the children, I was I was trying to teach them how big is nano when we are talking about nano. Right. And then yeah. I had this um, 
I, I developed this sort of a very, very simple thing that they draw a circle on, on a board. And of course, this has to be for children that already know division and sort of scaling. It has to match that curriculum. Um, and then I tell them, look, so imagine this is like 40 centimeter, but let's do the division, blah, 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 blah. And then I tell them, OK, this is now 400. But you know what, what else is like 40 micrometer? The hair on your hand is also 40 micrometer in diameter. And then they looked at it, all the faces, as soon as they lifted up from the hand and the hair, they were like, the eyes were popping out. And I remember in one of the classes, one of them was like, wow, that is midget. And to be honest, that day I was like, you know what? I'm done with life. I taught them how big is nano. And I think I can go home right now happily. Very much so. So that definitely is a, a passion spark. That's incredible. I love that story. That's a really yeah. nice one. Me too. Thank you. Oh, well, I'm looking forward to you learning German well enough to do it in Germany too then. Me too. Me too. <laughs> that would be interesting. Yeah. Looking forward as well. So then, I mean, did it feel like a wrench when you moved from Southampton? Um, I think I also have to say that I, I from Southampton, I had to move back to Iran because of some <laughs> visa matters. <laughs> um, I don't want to open the topic here, but also I, I had a, my visa also got rejected when I was in Iran and applied for UK again. So I actually spent two years in Iran. Mm -hmm. um, and I tried to make a life out of it. Um, and I, when I found a job and things were good, it's just that I realized that's not the environment I want to work at. Um, mm -hmm. Also saying that I couldn't find anything science related to my expertise in science. Mm -hmm. And that's when I decided, OK, I definitely want to move out of Iran. Mm -hmm. um, and I was looking for a job and Germany came came up. And uh, in, indeed, it was a culture shock. I mean, to be honest, from Southampton to Iran, I had one culture shock because Iran was different after eight years. And also from Iran to Germany, um, that was also another culture shock because I was naive and I thought Germany is just like England, like, another yeah. European country. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> and why wouldn't you think that? <laughs> I mean, I didn't know, right? I don't know who, I, I guess there are also people in Germany or in England who think the same, but. Sure, I'm sure. No you doubt. Know what, you go, yeah. Yeah, definitely. So you were still on the, on the academic path, I guess, when you, when you went to Germany. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I still, um, I loved academia. I loved science. I still love science. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, that's what I wanted to continue Keep in mind that, of course, the first day I decided to do a PhD, I thought I want to become a professor. But of course, you change as well. But this time when I was going to academia, I was like, I'm hoping to develop something and then I can start sort of my own company with it. But yes, I continued as a postdoc. I was first in Karlsruhe, they call it Karlsruhe Institute of Technology or KIT, basically, KITE. And then after that, from there, I moved to University of Stuttgart and I was there for another half, year and a half. Mm -hmm. And yeah, any any inspiring professors there? I mean, you, you say you were you initially wanted to be a professor. You've inspired all the kids in Southampton. <laughs> so in a way, you kind of are. <laughs> maybe. That, that's so nice of you. Thank you. Uh, maybe. I mean, uh, in, in Kaite and Stuttgart, I, to be honest, I was very much focused on on uh, developing what I what I was like okay the the idea of the startup but um it's very maybe very good I mean inspiring as of like I think I was very lucky that one of the the big professors that I was always just reading his papers and I never managed to talk to him or I, I met him one I saw him once this was a German professor that was now at Kaite okay I only saw him for once in the first conference I ever went to when I was a first year PhD student and Martin Wegner, Wegner, Wegner. and uh, I remember my own supervisor there he um, he was talking to him because they were both German as well and they sat at, at dinner at the conference dinner they sat together in the same and the same table and I was like wow I wish I was on that table sitting next to him <laughs> and then um then uh, when 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 I was in Kaite and I was working on a project that he was the guru for that, I was working on uh, 3D printing optical components. Um, there's this new technology, two-photon lithography, and actually is developed 
at University of um, at Carter Institute of Technology as well, mm -hmm. and um, um, so so they also actually they have a spin-off out of it that um, Zeiss sort of sponsors it. It's called NanoScribe. Massive, massive, uh, amazing. One of the one of the most successful technical developments science has ever seen. I mean, in my opinion, anyhow. So I went to him and I was like, "This is my. This is what I think I can do. This is my proposal, and I would like to see if if." you 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 would like to be on my proposal and but the way i managed to see him was that i wrote him the story that i remember when i was a first year phd student i wanted to sit next to you now i cannot believe i'm in the same university as you i don't know if that did the trick or not but then he answered my my email and i managed to see him and he was very welcoming and very supportive indeed um so that's my and i would i would say that's my inspiring professor in germany yeah um, yeah, well, flattery, I guess they say, gets you everywhere. I, I'm sure talent has something to do with it as well. <laughs> I mean, he likes the proposal, so in that sense, exactly. I'm I'm really happy. And uh, and his opinion also really mattered to me because also, especially as a as a as a as a postdoc or as a junior researcher, of course, these sort of stamps on uh, like a um, stamps on your proposal that yeah, it makes sense. It's feasible. It's doable. Um, it's basically a yes, and you, then you're happy with that. Definitely makes makes your makes your spirit makes the motivation going on and on and on. Sure, yeah, it sounds like it. Um, now I'm just wondering because you then you you said before that you were working on the idea for the startup, but I mean I wonder if it's just sort of fundamentally in your makeup because you said also that you were an ex experimental scientist at, at heart so I mean was it a combination of factors what 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 actually led you towards entrepreneurship and this particular startup I am um, I I mean I don't know that yet right but um, or maybe it is um one thing that always came to my mind was that even at at school and even at university I always wanted to be to do new things and be leader like um, like school activities, you prepare, I don't know, uh, I don't know what they call them in English or even in German, you prepare these wall posters and then everyone writes something, collects an article from somewhere and does the design and all of that. So I, I, I led a lot of those teams, for example, or at university, whenever we had a conference, I was this first volunteer at the, at the front of the row and helping everyone. And all of that. So I think that the 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 hunger for being a leader was something that I was definitely like, um, I want to do. I want to do my own thing. That's for sure. And um, th also, I think it's a matter of um, your science or what you've made in the lab to to become something that people are using it. I was. I have to confess, I was never the best paper writer as a scientist I still do I mean I don't have many papers either um but but that's the thing I was always like I don't want to write papers I want to make things I want to make the next one and the next one and the next one mm -hmm. and also the other thing I always thought was that I also want to see that people are using what I'm making um mm -hmm. that would be my dream and this is why I think a combination of all these three that I mentioned pushed me through the entrepreneurship and especially the project that I was using. Of course, the project, I started from the technology side, but then I got to the topic of cancer diagnostics. And wow, that's an impactful topic. That's something that you definitely see the impact in people's life. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, that goodness me, and that's crosses all sectors it touches everyone let's face it it's broad you might say definitely yeah so that was that the topic and in, in the startup what what was tell me a bit more about the actual startup and how that yeah. came, how it actually came about yeah so I mean I go chronologically as I said I started from this technology yeah. side I mean again you're this researcher you sit in the lab, you make something and you think that oh, everyone uh, would love to buy my little fiber optic, optical tweezer, whatever that is. Oh. And, and then um, then what I did was that I, I, I quit my contract at the university, my research contract. 
And there was uh, there was this entrepreneur accelerator program. Actually, I mean, they are based mostly in UK, but they had that one in Berlin as well. They call entrepreneur first. Mm -hmm. So they also scout uh, individuals. They scout technical people like PhDs or postdocs from certain universities and mm -hmm. consulting people from McKinsey or um, Deloitte or Accenture or whatever. And then they put th these people into like one pot and they literally tell them, sit together, come up with a project and then find a business case and then pitch it to us. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't know that um, your amazing technical project in the lab um, might not be something people buy outside. Mm -hmm. So I went to this program and I told everyone, yes, I'm making an optical tweezer and people should buy it and blah, blah, blah. The whole people in our cohort, 50 people, they had a they had a comprehensive course about optical tweezers. I think none of them knew what is an optical tweezer before. And they got they at by the end of the course, everybody knew what is optical tweezer and they were opinion, they had opinions about the technology as well. So I'm glad again I inspired 50 <laughs> people on the optical tweezer topic too. But anyhow, that's it. I I I we couldn't find, I couldn't find the commercial case of an optical tweezer with there was the sort of the um selling value proposition that I was proposing. Um, but the program finished and um, I was like, okay, you know what? I've already given up my job. By the way, all of that happened with Corona. So Corona happened. I had no job and I was going to this program and I was like, you know what? I've already decided. So let's just can continue. And I continued on my own, which I think was um, the timing of Corona also really helped because everyone was at home and everyone was loving these video conferences. So I got a lot of people who agreed to talk to me and helped me and were super helpful. And through all of these I'm in the business world, in the startup world, you call it customer development. Through all of these talking to people and asking them questions and questions and questions, I came across the field of, okay, I do, I mean, also optical tweezer is that you hold a particle with light so there is no mechanical connection and that means you're not damaging that particle so this particle can be a cell a, a biological cell as well and that means you're not damaging that biological cell i mean that's, that's incredibly useful um i mean i thought it was it's very useful it's it is useful not on its own but the, the other aspect is that um we are holding it which is perfect that means any external physical effect on it is cancelled but also if you if you sort of like study its light properties optical properties um and you compare it with healthy healthy cells you can find out if it's not a healthy cell or if it is a healthy cell and that can be your um method of identification for certain mm -hmm. disease mm -hmm. and then of course i came across cancer that cancer has a big market and that would be very useful for cancer diagnostics this is how it all came came around together so I also called it, I, I still call it the um, optical micro manipulation lab on a tip, which was the name of my proposal that I never got the money for research proposal, but mm -hmm. Omlot and, and it works, it's, it's focus, it is focused on cancer diagnostics um, mm -hmm. using photonics and AI. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think it's a great shame you didn't get the funding for that. It sounds like it could have been very useful in quite a few hands. Yeah, I mean, I I, really, I I think so as well. But um, when it comes into the startup world and the business world, things are different. So um, one, I mean, um, investors were positive on the topic, of course. Mm -hmm. They had a little bit of hesitation on the technology. But of course, that means I needed time to prove to, prove to them that it works. I showed them the proof of principle. And to, to go further, I needed more help and, of course, more resources, which means I needed money to be yeah. able to employ people. And that's what they said that, okay, um, so you, first of all, you can't do it alone. I know that as well, but also you should have other people as co-founders because again, it's too much to do on your own. And that's where my, um, I was not very successful to find a co-founder to help me through the path and also help me even to raise the money for it. And um, that's why I decided, I mean, at the end of the day, I also have to find my way as well. You can't bang on a door that is knocked closed for like many years and years. So that's why I decided to stop the project. Mm -hmm. I guess it's always a door that you could reopen in the future. Um, that's the plan. I'm hoping for the same thing. Great.
Well, I'll keep my fingers crossed for you for that, for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so now you're in the, can we call it the corporate world? Um, in AMS, let's um. So it's a the international network for um for advanced materials. Is that is that right? Exactly, exactly. So I mean, um, Inam is um is focuses on innovation, mm -hmm. um, within the field of advanced material, and um, it's a non for profit organization, and it has uh, members from the corporate side, from the research side, investor side, uh, as well as many startups. Mm -hmm. And as I said, because the focus is on innovation, that means we, we are helping startups and connecting them to the corporate members for innovation, whether it's to work on a certain project together, become strategic partners, or even for the corporates to invest in them. So that's what we are doing. And over here in Ina, we have three different accelerators such incubator programs that are addressing a different stage of a startup. So one is for early stage, idea stage, which is me, my, I mean, let's say could have been my startup. Another one is for uh, mid stage startups. And we also have a program for growth stage startups. And the reason for that is, I mean, again, I come from the same deep tech hardware startup field. The needs of these startups are First of all, very different from all the other startups around the like um, in the in the globe, like software, I don't know, app startups. And they also need more um, sort of investment as well. Also, they need more time for the product development. And also at different stages, they have different needs and they have different they need they they um, have to be supported in different ways. And that's also why we have different programs for different startups as of stage wise. Are they are they all in the health sector or does it vary? What, what is there a particular are there particular categories of startups there? Yeah, so um Enum focuses on advanced material, which mm -hmm. means um there is only a need for the product to have an advanced material aspect to it. So on the vertical, they're all from different verticals. They might be in the health sector, they might be in, we have, a. I mean, semiconductor is something that, um, again, I, I connect with as well, very well. Um, we even have like, we have a startup that they are making advanced material for new type of mattresses. So they're basically, at the end of the day, they're producing mattresses, right? But they are an advanced material startup. So they are part of our community as well. Mm -hmm. um, so as I said, vertical wise, it's we are very agnostic. We only need the product who has a little bit of a um, advanced material. And also that includes optics and photonics as well. So that's also where I come in. Yes, exactly. And it, I think it's so nice to actually hear the application areas of these technologies, even though they're quite upstream and they can seem quite abstract initially. But hearing, yes, mattresses, that's really something that everyone can identify with. Yeah, yeah, and, exactly. You know, I mean, maybe the scientists among us will definitely know that everything comes from somewhere. Um, but maybe, you know, it's not the first thing that comes into everyone's mind. Gosh, what amazing advanced materials this must have been devised from. That's very true. Definitely. Definitely. So you're 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 now you're still scratching that entrepreneurial itch by by advancing other entrepreneurs in their missions. <clears throat> De definitely it um it's a very exciting world seeing mm. that for, I mean again. It's innovation, right? And um, I think we said that at the beginning, I love new things. I love new projects. So hearing about all of these new projects, I also get excited and not all the time, but sometimes scientifically, I can also talk to them and ask them, how is it going? And then hear about the exciting lab stories where they're banging their heads against the door or the wall or the lab setup and it's not working and all of that. So in that sense, it's very exciting. The other thing is that because I've been there myself as well, and I've been through all the stages, whether it was the business case, whether finding a funding, I relate to them very well. And I think, I mean, I, I can help them with practical experience rather than theoretical experience and also very fresh. So um, I think it has been a good match. It has definitely been the, the best next step to take in my career to be able to first for myself also still feel connected to this world and also help the, the new entrepreneurs to succeed as well. 
Absolutely. It sounds like the perfect fit. Um, thank you. I believe so as well. <laughs> um, so um, Inam have a podcast. Do you want to say about that? Yes, yes. So Inam has a podcast called Start Up the Science. Mm-hmm. Um, as, as I said, because we are focused on advanced material, of course, we have a lot of startups that they also come from the scientific background. And uh, that's that's the whole that's the whole aim of the of the of the podcast as well is to mention successful stories of starting up the science, all of these deep tech projects. And uh, we have um, we have discussions with um, entrepreneurs that are either now network or have been to our program, mm-hmm. um, and they talk about their experience. Again, it might be depending on the journey they've had. They it's focused on different aspects uh, but yeah I, I highly recommend people listening to that there are amazing stories uh, of successful um, founders and how they managed to get to where they are that start up the science and they can find it on the Inam website is that right yes exactly we have a we have a page allocated to start up the science and also if they follow our LinkedIn page um, they do get the get the updates about the podcast and of course other Enam activities as well. But they can also reach the startup, the startup the science podcast from the LinkedIn page too. Oh, wonderful. Well, Asa, it's been a real treat hearing about your journey from start to now. Um thank, thank you. you very much for joining me. Um thank you for having me. It's a pleasure, and um, hopefully we'll speak again. Yeah, looking forward. <laughs>